What happened to Shavuot by the Rebbe? There were a lot of Fabrengans in a short amount of time. That's the answer. I'm asking myself, what, what's, what can I tell you special about a, about a particular Shavuot? I have memories, but nothing that I feel like is instructive, you know. But that's what Shavuot was. Shavuot by all the Rebbe was a two-day Yom Tif, and somehow around that Yom Tif, there was so much Torah. By the Rebbe, I'm learning that my modem from Tavshin Lamed Vav. That's the year that I'm learning. So you had a Maimir of Shabbos Mavarchim. You had a Maimir of Shabbos Rosh Chodesh. The Rebbe fabringed Ed of Yom Tif. The Rebbe fabringed Motzei Yom Tif. And he usually fabringed the Shabbos after also. So in a, in a span, depending on the arrangement of days, a span of eight days, ten days, you could have five my modem. That's how Shavuos was. By the earlier Rabbeim, it was even more. And by I Rebbe also, this is something that people don't realize, that for the first 20 years of the Rebbe's Nesiyas, the Rebbe used to eat the Sudas upstairs in the apartment of the Alter Rebbe's, the Defeatic Rebbe's Rebbe's. During that time, the Rebbe didn't go home to Sudas Yom Tif. After the Alter Rebbe passed away, the Rebbe would go home for Sudas Yom Tif. Once the Rebbe went home, he didn't come back to 770. But during those 20 years, which finished in Tafshan Lamid, 1970, the Rebbe ate the meal upstairs. He went downstairs in his room and he stayed in his room. So 3 o'clock in the morning, the Rebbe walked out of his room, walked into the show, sat down, and said a maimed. It was one of the rare occasions where the Rebbe said a maimed without a fabrengen. Usually, the tradition of Chabad was that Rebbeim said a maimed as an entity unto itself. The Rebbe said a maimed as part of a fabrengen. One of the rare occasions when there was a maimed that was not connected to any sikhs was Lel Shavuos. It would walk into the show. I don't even think they'd sing a nigan. It would just sit down and start to speak like this. And this probably started Yud Beza, Yud Gimel, the first, second, or third year of the Rebbe's Nesiyas. And it continued until Tav Shalom. It was another maimed. But by the other Rebbeim, Shavuos is three nights, yeah? So there was a Maimah the first night, that means the night of Tikkun. There was a Maimah the second night, the Maimah the third night. And there's Maimah Shabbos before, and the Shabbos after. Tzemach Tzedek used to say Chassidus before Lich Benchen. Out of Yom Tov, he said a Maimah, then he said another Maimah, the next had another Maimah. Shavuos was packed with Teireh by the Rabbeim. And by the Rabbeim was packed with Fabrengen. Mamish, packed with Fabrengen. There was a Fabrengen Shabbos Mavarchim, right? Then this year Shabbos is Erev Shavuos, right? Bringing Shabbos Mavarchim. There was a bringing Erev Shavuos, there was a bringing Matzah Shavuos, there was a bringing the Shabbos after. And sometimes the Rebbe found an excuse to say another for bringing still. There was a Yid whose name was Zalman Jaffa. Zalman Jaffa. He probably has grandchildren in this room. Zalman Jaffa's time to come to the Rebbe official was Shavuos. I remember him coming every Monday and Wednesday. <laughs> Monday and Thursday. He was here all the time in my years. But for many years he was Shavuos. It was his, he was a Shavuos sticker. You know, Chassidim Amalek Titan used to identify themselves by the Yom Tov that they came to the Rebbe. One would say, Ich bin a Rosh Hashanah dikir, I'm a Rosh Hashanah dikir. Another one would say, Ich bin a Yom Kippur dikir, I'm a Yom Kippur, Ich bin a Simchas Teire dikir. And the, there were a lot of Chassidim, they're Yom Tov Shavuos. Zalman Yaffa, I don't know if it was his idea or was the Rebbe's idea, he came to the Rebbe Shavuos probably beginning from the early 60s. And there were a number of very beautiful things about his coming to the Rebbe. Number one, the Rebbe told him that Yom Tif is v'samachta v'chagecha, ato, v'besecha, to you and your wife and your children. The Rebbe said, you cannot come to the Rebbe without your wife because you're going to be missing the mitzvah of Simchat Yom Tif with your wife. So Mrs. Jaffe always came. They came as a couple. And the Rebbe hosted them. That's so interesting. The Rebbe had an apartment. <laughs> they had an apartment, two apartments. When they bought 770, the buildings, you know, if, if you look at 770, 770 is a house. Next to that house, there's two apartment buildings. Those two apartment buildings are full of offices. There was a time that there was a plan in those office buildings to build um, Adidas, apartments. that would belong to the Rebbe that would be specified for the Rebbe's guests, the Rebbe hosted guests. Zalman Jaffe would come to the Rebbe every Shores, the Rebbe hosted him. And in the coil, there was apartments in the coil, and it became crazy. I mean, the people broke the locks, and they went in. And everyone thought that everything belongs to them. It was the Rebbe's private, private space, 
And the Rebbe wrote a letter to Zalman Jaffe at one point saying, I must apologize that I cannot accommodate you because people don't respect private space and the apartment which I have, which is designated for guests like you, is invaded by any yokel who needs a place to sleep. So the Rebbe says, don't come because I cannot host you. And he wrote back to the Rebbe, of course I'm coming. I'll make my own arrangements. Zalman Jaffe was not a battling and he wasn't, a bal- he wasn't another man. He made his own arrangements, but the Rebbe felt obligated to host him, probably for a decade, probably for 10 years. He would come Shavuos and the Rebbe would host him. Zalman Jaffe understood Yiddish, but I don't think Zalman Jaffe was a Talmud Chacham. I don't think he understood what the Rebbe was saying. I remember still, in other words, even though this is so much later, that Zalman Jaffe would sit next to his son-in-law and the Rebbe would ask Kashis and Rashi and they would turn to him so how many kashas are we holding? And he had to give a number. And kashas could be 15 kashas, 16 kashas, 17 kashas. And Shmuel Luz was like, I had to keep track and tell the Shver, in case that I would ask him how many kashas. And this was, this was part of his kiruv. When he came for Shavuos on the Shabbos before and the Shabbos after, that would say, Rashi Sikhe, that would just turn to him out of the blue, no vifel kashas halt mir in Yiddish. How many kashas are we holding? And Zalman <laughs> Shmuel would tell him, and he would tell the Rebbe, and the, and the Rebbe had nachas. I remember once, they asked him, how many questions? Okay, let's have a couple more, so we'll have toif, 17 kashas. It was, the sikha was gathered about, about Bichas Kayin. Bichas Kayin has 15 words, so 15 words, stimmt 15 kashas. It was, I'll ask two more, I mean 17 kashas. See, so he, he was one of the regular features of the Rebbe, Shuas. By the time I was of age to remember, he came for Pesach, he came for Rosh Hashanah, he came for Rosh Hashanah for sure. But in the earlier years, before I could remember, he was a Shuas ticket. And he had two shtick that are both worth mentioning. One is takash shtick and the other is a schus. He was drawn to Lubavitch for two reasons. Number one, he had a Zayde who, who used to walk to Lubavitch. He had a Zayde who used to walk to Lubavitch and he, he knew that Zayde. And as a little child, his Zayde used to describe them literally, young into foot. They walked from the shtetl where they lived to walk on foot. It took weeks to walk to Lubavitch. And in his childhood imagination, he imagined what it must be like to walk to Lubavitch. He grew up in Manchester. He was a modern man. Zalman Jaffe was from, but we'd call him today modern Orthodox. But he had this childhood memory of going to Mrebbe. When the Minti and Shemtiv came to Manchester, it was Rebbe Shliach. And he met Mr. Jaffe and he talked to him about Lubavitch. All those childhood memories came back to him, and the idea of going to see the Rebbe became for him like a very exciting thing. The first time him and his wife took a trip on the St. Mary, uh, I think it was St. Mary, it was a very famous luxury liner, and they stayed in Manhattan, Chas Vashom, they should stay in Crown Heights, this is inner city, and they came to see the Rebbe, but then they became, Mamish Teshavim, they became regulars in Crown Heights, they became very comfortable, um, and he would come to all the Fabreng initiation. But the other thing drew him to Lubavitch was the energy. Zalman Yafi was a Frey Lecherit. And he loved the singing. <laughs> and he asked the Rebbe, how come nobody sings? So the Rebbe says to him, you sing. So when he was here, you see, you have to understand, this is hard for you to imagine. There was a time that they didn't sing Hu Lekeinu every Shabbos. There was a time, for sure, we never sang. Rachman Ulzan, Hoyle said to sing Lechadeidi. But Hu Lekeinu they didn't sing. Hadar as Ramona, there was a big deal to get the Chazan to sing. So when Zalman was here, he would stand behind the Rebbe and he start to sing. And the whole show would give Maziak. I can't hear you. What was I'm not going into it. It's Lubavitch's shtick. It's uptight, frigid Russian nervousness. If you don't understand this, you don't have those roots. I understand it. Um, um, some people can't bend, you know why? Because in the back of the shirt they have a stick that runs from the back of the neck till the place where you sit and it keeps the tunnish. It's a rigid, it's a shtick, it's a mishagas. The Rebbe wanted we should sing and it took years and years and years for people to start singing. The Russians were always angry that they were singing. It's so un- improper, it's so not. Uh. <laughs> um, and the Rebbe was from the, he came from Russia. They couldn't know how a Russian guy could be so loose, they didn't understand it. Um, so he would start to sing, and no one sang with him. And the Chev would look at him like, you <laughs> fool, you're singing about the Rebbe. It was just a serious place. <laughs> and one guy, I know this, by the way, because I read his books, and I would, I would encourage you to read it. If you want a very candid, realistic 
human experience of 77, they read my encounter. My encounter with the Rebbe, they, he printed three volumes already. My encounter with the Rebbe, if you go online and Google my encounter with the Rebbe, you can download the whole collection. I downloaded all of them. Till 1992 or 94, every single one. The Rebbe made him write it and publish it. And after Gimbal Thomas, his grandchildren published three volumes of my encounter that goes probably through the mid 70s. They're wonderful reads and they're so intimate. I read them and I feel like I'm in 770 because he's not writing like a chassid. He was a chassid. But he was also a human being. And his, his humanity was never overshadowed by his fear of the Rebbe, you know, by his chassidists, like by most of us. So it's a very, very genuine, it's a very, very genuine depiction of 770. When you read his writings, the way it sounds, that's how it was. And he makes fun of people, and he tells stories about the, the Mishra Goyim in 770. I mean, the, 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 edit, the published books, they took a lot of stuff out. The original My Encounter, I mean, he talks about his grandchildren losing their shoes, and anybody who came from England, and something happened to them, it's in his book, and the whole world has to know, 60 years on, that this person had this unfortunate event happen to him in 770, in 1971, or something like that. Um, but they're very, they're d delicious. They're very wonderful. You can, if you go online and just Google My Encounter with the Rebbe, and it'll come up, you'll see all of them. They're all available, and you download the whole collection. They're very intimate, they're very wonderful to read. Really, really wonderful to read. Anyway, so, he described, there was a guy named Sarge Fisher, a, a, a military guy, became a Balchova. He stood next to Zalman Jaffe in the front. He, I remember him, he lived in Kran Heights for many, many years. So when Jaffe would sing, Fisher would sing with him, and the whole show would say, oh, no, no, shah. So Zalman Jaffe, I don't understand you, Rebbe. You know, you talk about Simcha, and here I come. <laughs> I complain, how come no one sings? You tell me to sing, and when I sing, no one wants to sing with me. So the Rebbe says, you don't have to listen to them. Venish Nespal. If the Rebbe made once with his hand, the whole shul sang. If Chas Shalom didn't make his hands, then Jaffe was a bad guy. The Rebbe wanted him to, to, to start the nigun, but he also wanted us to grow up. You, know, you, don't, you don't only sing because the Rebbe says to sing. But that's how it was. I mean, he, his biggest complaint was he was invited to the feed of Rebbe Suda. He was always invited upstairs. And he says it was the most uncomfortable meal in the world. He's sitting at a table. Everyone's sitting up there in jail. I mean, they're sitting at the same table with the Rebbe, so it's not so comfortable. But he wanted to sing. So he said, how come by, you know, I, in my Shabbos table, we sing. How come your Shabbos table, they don't sing? So Rebbe says, you should stop. So he would sing out loud, and no one sang with him. <laughs> this was, he was one of the, the features of, of Shuas. But there's another thing about Zalman Jaffe, and this is Taka Grace's Shus. He always asked the Rebbe for more Fabrenians. The Rebbe Fabren again. He would come for at least two Shabbos, the Shabbos before, the Shabbos after, and then Yom Tov sometimes more. He had Yechidus and the Rebbe, the Kiruvim that the Rebbe gave him are unimaginable. And he would ask, maybe the Rebbe make an extra Fabreng in the Shabbos before or the Shabbos after. And the Rebbe would tell him, I will try. You know, the Rebbe used to say, the only person who says, I will try, that actually does it is me. You know, most people, they promise that they're going to do it, they don't do it. The person tells you, I'll try, it's basically already gave five. He says, but when I say, I will try, and that we, there are probably a dozen Fabrengans that we have in this chus of this man. Maybe a dozen as a guzman, but a lot. He would ask the Rebbe, the Rebbe wasn't planning to Fabreng, and then he would say, maybe the Fabreng again, and he had that kind of relationship with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe would give in. And that's one of the features of Shvuas. The result of this is, this is what I'm saying to you, Shvuas was a saturation of Torah. That's what it was. It was a saturation of Torah. It was a lot of Torah. By the early Rabbeim, it was four or five, my modern see this. And by the Rebbe, it also was. But it wasn't in three days. It was over a week or ten days. You know, if you count from Erev Shchedesh, Sivan, until the Shabbos after Shvuas, you can have five Abrengans, which means five my modern, Or even six, you know, depending on the year. It was Gepakt Met Torah. Gepakt Met Torah. The other feature of Shuas was the Rabbonim, right? In Lubavitch, they used to call Shuas Chagamatzis. Rabbonim could not come to the Rebbe Sukkot because there were all these Shailas and the Dalad Minim and the Sukkah. They couldn't come to the Rebbe Pesach, Pesach Tuchan Ashir Shailas. But the only Shaila on Shuas is the cheesecake. If you have a Fleshik oven, as most people had, can you cash it to make cheesecake? The halacha is you're not allowed to cash and look at the Fleshik. You're not allowed to do it. Even if you have a self-cleaning oven, halachically, you're not allowed to change it. If you use your self-cleaning oven as fleshik, you're not allowed to flip it by self-cleaning it because you're afraid you're going to make a mistake. The exception is the cheesecake and food. 
You're allowed a kasha, a fleisha cover once a year. You, in a way that's basically, it's, it's, it's a malin tzutzis, it's a liban gomor, which is what self-cleaning is considered, even though some people are asking shahs on it. And then it can be milchik, and you, they cash in it again. But you now have to do it. So that's the only shvu with shayla. I mean, the flowers and shul, the babbage don't even have flowers and shul. But where do you put the flowers? What kind of flowers do you put in shul? There's not the rabbani shashas. There's no shayla shvu. So the rabbani came to the rabbi. I'm all in, in the earlier daughters, they came to the earlier rabbi in Fashtetzach. But here the rabbani shvu was a moya that rabbani came. And the rabbi used to acknowledge them. They came sometimes a week before in Eshchedesh, and the rabbi would the bring them, give them mashke. He would speak a sikhah to the Rabbana. They very, very much wanted that the Rabbana from all over the world should get together and have a meeting where they could share ideas. And the Rabbana would often make proposals for discussions for the Rabbana. A Rav made a hey, oh, girls, I don't know how to tell this to you. It's the single most important job in the Jewish people. A Rebbe, of course, besides for that. There's no position more responsible and more earnest and more sacred and more maligned then a Rav who paskan shaylas, not a Rav who makes speeches. I do that. A Rav who paskan shaylas. A Rav made a Rav. Yeshua Medini sits in his house and people come to him with shaylas. When you'll get married, you'll find out what shaylas means and how important a Rav is. A Rav has to be a Yerei Shamayim, a Rav has to be a Talmud Chacham, and a Rav has to be a nice person, has to be a mensch. It's, it's, a, it's a special thing. And a Rav is, he's the butt of every joke. He's the punching bag, in Lubavitch especially, what we do to our Rabbonim, it's like almost a mitzvah. You make him a tarav and then you ruin, you make him miserable. But we don't have exclusive rights to that in every community. It's the same story with Rabbanim. But by the Rebbe, Rabbanim were very important. When the Rebbe encouraged certain people to take the Ayanis, in other words, to study smicha, not like I studied smicha, but to actually become a, a Rav, made a Rav, a pilot, it was a very special thing. It was a very, very serious thing. And the Rabbanim came to the Rebbe. A lot of them, from Eretz Yisrael and from America. And the Rebbe would tat kazach mitzay. And one of the areas of halacha that I would talk to, oftentimes around Shavuos, when the Rabbanim were here, was modern shilas, new technologies, you know, in medicine and in, 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 and in, and in, and in the kitchen. You have new appliances with new halachas that the Rabbanim should familiarize themselves with the technology, familiarize themselves with the technology, so that they could be informed when it comes to paskinning a shaila, you know, a rav is not allowed to look at a shaila and say, if this is a pupik and this is a needle, then it's straight. He has to know what a pupik is, he has to know what a needle is. He has to familiarize himself. And this was one of the things that Rebbe talked to Shavuos, not every year, but occasionally. And more than once I heard Rebbe discuss it, talking to the rabbana that when you get together, you should, kind of you should talk over. So that's a little bit on Shavuos. My topic that I chose, just that was just an introduction, that was a hello. What I want to talk to you about, in other words, my shvuas uh, in Yonah de Yoyma class with you is to talk about the six days or the seven days. The Rebbe brings in many sikhs, the Shita Satur, that every day starting today, every day starting today is a Yom Tov. You know, from today till your base seven, we don't talk And there's different opinions about why, but the Rebbe holds it's not because of Shlesh is Bala, it's because every day is a different Yom Tif. Rish is one Yom Tif. Bez Sivan, which is tomorrow, is the second Yom Tif. Gimel Sivan, which is uh, Thursday, is a third Yom Tif. Dalit Sivan, which is Friday, is a fourth Yom Tif. And Hay Sivan, which is Shabbos, was the fifth Yom Tif. Each one is a different Yom Tif. Uh, okay, you wanted to ask me a question. You said Bez Yeah. Who was al Jaffe? He was a Yid from Manchester, who the Rebbe had a special, special affinity for. It was very makad of him, who built Lubavitch in Manchester, whose children are shluchim. That's al Jaffe. Yep. And he came, you probably have, there's probably Jaffe's in this room. I mean, there's, there's a lot of Jaffe's. Anybody in the room Jaffe? Okay, we got one. Okay, you'll ask us exactly who al Jaffe was. There's a lot of, there's five generations at this point. From one couple, from one couple. If they had stayed modern Orthodox, they would have had two kids. Each one of those two kids would have had a, maybe a kid. And uh, that's what it would have been. But never became Lubavitchers, and then they had kind of other children the way you're supposed to have. Go ahead. Oh, I'm not discussing halacha. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm not at all. Speak to your local rabbi. Um, I'm sorry. It's not my job. Right. And it's not my expertise. Um, 
So I want to talk to you about these yomtivs. What is the yomtiv of Rish Chedish? What's the yomtiv of Bez? What's the yomtiv of Gimel? What's the yomtiv of Dal? What's the yomtiv of Hay? What's the yomtiv of Vav? That's my class. That's my lecture. What happened today? <laughs> Today's is Chedish, and it's Tuesday. That year, according to the Rabbana, was Monday. Right? The Gemara says, The Kula Alma B'Shabbos Nitna Teira. The Gemara said the Shabbos, the Teira was given on Shabbos. We're having Shavuos on Sunday. Yidin left Mitzayim Thursday, right? This year Pesach was Shabbos. We have Shavuos on Sunday and Monday. But the Gemara says, B'Kula Alma B'Shabbos Nitna Teira. Everybody agrees the Teira was given on a Shabbos. It's a machlekes whether it was the seventh of Sivan, in which case they arrived on Sunday, or it was the sixth of Sivan, in which case they arrived on a Monday, and that's the shita that most people go with, because that's shita of the Chachomim, of the Rev. Rabbi Yaisi is the Das Yochid who says that it was Zion. What happened today? They traveled from Rafidim to Sinai. They took a trip. The whole Jewish nation, several million people, had to pack up all their belongings and take a walk, come to a new location, and park. They went from a place called Rafidim to a place called Sinai, and it wasn't very far. It could have been as little as a kilometer, a mil, a very short walk. And they traveled from Lerifidim, they came to Sinai, and they all rested. And, it, and the Gemara says, you know what happened on that day? Nothing happened. Nothing. The expression of the Gemara is, Hashem didn't tell them anything, because they were exhausted from their trip. Nothing happened. Yidin came to Har Sinai, and you have to remember, They've been counting days, right? We count Oymer because they counted Svido. They were counting the days. They were so excited. They knew the Sev Chamishim Yayim. They knew that 50 days after they go, after they go out of Mitzvah, they're going to marry the Abishter and get his Teda and become connected to him and so on and so forth. They were counting the days. So they arrived on the location. And they came right to Moshe and knew, Moshe, what's going on? And Moshe says, come back tomorrow. Today there's nothing. Why? You're tired. We're tired. We walked a kilometer. We're ready to work. Give us something to do. Nothing happened. <laughs> Nothing happened. You know, it's like the story there was about to be a Gzeda, and the Rebbe got together little children, and he said, The Gzeda was in his battle. What happened? Nothing happened. Yeah? So nothing is not nothing. Sometimes nothing is much more than something. And that's how the Rebbe explains it. The Rebbe in the Sikh Chedek of Ches, one of my favorite Sikhs, page 7. Good to see Chedek of Ches, page 7. He says, Hashem didn't tell them anything because they were tired from the trip. I say tired from the trip. Every time the Jews traveled, physically, they traveled spiritually. And usually when they traveled, they were busy fight, fighting and arguing and complaining. They were arguing with one another about what the travel means. And they were complaining to the Abishta what the Abishta wants from them. When they came to Har Sinai, there was no Tarumis, they had no complaints to God, no Machlaikis, they had no differences with one another. They achieved each echad belayev echad as one man with one heart. So the Rebbe says that journey was exhausting. To come to a place where finally, <laughs> finally Hashem tells them to move. And they're not complaining that Hashem is moving them too quick. And they're not arguing about what the meaning of the move is. That was what happened that day. The, 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 the reason they were tired from the trip was not the walk. It was the pnimiz de ka of coming to a place where they can all be happy about listening to the Ebishter and they can all agree with one another about the meaning of what the Ebishter wants. And that's the Pshat, like Omer Lehuvu Lehmidi, he told them nothing. Bishem Chul they were tired from taking the spiritual journey to the Madrege of being Isha Chad Chad as one man with one heart. But then the Rebbe says it deeper. That the meaning of the words Bishem Chul means the, the journey of Bittl. Chul means weakness. So the Rebbe translates Chul like the word Bittl. The, they traveled on a road to Bittl. And the Rebbe says when a person is in a state of Bittl, you can't give him instructions. Because you give him instructions, they argue, what, what, what does it mean? <laughs> and how do you do it? You have 600,000 Jews, 600,000 opinions. So they, the Chosh Orcha means they journey to a place called Bittl. They journey to a place where they were all submissive to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the Abisha didn't tell them anything because when you're in a state of Bittal, Hashem doesn't want to, quote, ruin it by them using their minds to understand what he means and what they should do with it and so on and so forth. So the Shchaydish Nisan, Sivan, which is today, is a Yomtev. It's the Yomtev of nothing. That's why it's the Yomtev, but it's the Yomtev of nothing, which is more than something. It's the Yomtev of Bittal. The Yidden became nothing, which is how they achieved Ki'isha Chod Balei 
which was the first step of preparation for Matan Torah. The Rebbe says, to be a Jew, you need two things. A, <laughs> turn your brain off. B, turn your brain back on. <laughs> turn your brain off means that when it comes to the Ebesh Tetznas of Anishma, turn your brain back on after you accept. Now you need to understand and you need to argue. If you and the guy next to you or the rabbi next to you disagrees, you tell him what you think. Because you have to understand and you have to come to the truth and you have to know how to practice and so on. So the Rebbe says the Hachon of involves both. Turning the brain off to have bittel and turn the brain back on to use your mind to understand what the Ebishter wants. The first part of that preparation was today. So today is a Shechedit. We wouldn't say Tachnan anyway. But today is a Yom Tif. It's the Yom Tif of Achtas Yisrael, the Yom Tif of Jewish unity, which is a great, great, great miracle. Anybody who knows Jews knows how big a miracle that is. But the Pneum is that, that miracle was that Yidin achieved the Bittl. That's what happened today. Okay? Reish Chedish Sim. What's tomorrow? No, it's Beis Sivan. Beis Sivan, you look at every calendar, it says Yoy Mam Yuchas, the day of our Yichas. Okay, in plain, simple English, this is the day that we became the chosen people, or the hated people, and those two go together. <laughs> Today is the Atavachatonu, tomorrow, Wednesday. Bay Sivan is the day that Abisha told us, you're going to be mine, special. I'm going to have a special relationship with you, different than other nations. The Jewish people are going to be chosen. And uh, the, the, the technical history is as follows. According to Rashi, at least, I know that Rahman doesn't agree, but according to Rashi, at least, Moshe had a rule. He only went up to Hashem very early in the morning after his coffee, before his morning coffee, he used to say. Moshe didn't go up during the day. If he went up and he came down, he didn't go up a second, he went until the next morning. So the Shechayi Stephen, he didn't go up the mountain because they arrived in the afternoon. The next morning, he climbed up to the top of the mountain and he says to the Abish, I don't know how he addressed the Abish there, but the Gemara says, <laughs> He didn't say hello when the Ebishter was insulted. How come he has no derecheres and he has no menschlichkeit? So Meshach Rabbeinu said, that in my, where I come from, a slave doesn't say good morning to his master. It's considered rude. So the Ebishter said to Meshach, you should tell me good morning. <laughs> tell me good morning. And Meshach Rabbeinu tells him good morning, which is a whole, I gave him a brach, which is a beautiful, beautiful story. But Meshach got the second morning and he doesn't say hello. He shows up and he tells the Ebishter, okay, so what? What's going to happen now? And the Ebishter basically, and I know this is going to be colloquial, this is going to sound simplistic and silly and imaginative, but it's, it's really a, a crisp way to bring out the story. He handed him a contract. It wasn't a written contract, it was a spoken contract, but he handed him a contract. And the contract says, Hashem Yidin, you know, there's a lot of communities of Jews that actually have a, a version of this ksuba, what the Kosten is offering, the Kala with the Kala, so they read it on Shavuot, we don't read it. Avraham has a song, I think we made a song out of it. Hakel Shorav Akayam. Avraham Fried has a song based on this Ksuba with Yid and the Ebishter, but we, it's not in our, it doesn't come from Arizal, it's not in our Nusach. He gave a contract. What's the contract? The contract says what God is offering, what the Jewish people are offering. God says to the Jewish people as follows I'm going to make you my favorite. You're going to be Segula, which means my treasure. You're going to be Mamlachas Koyedim, a kingdom of priests. The Goy Kodesh, a holy nation. You give all the a lie. I'm going to make you my own. That's the deal. And there's a caveat to that. There's a very small, important piece of fine print, which is I'll never change my mind. Hashem wrote into the contract that you agree to my terms. You're going to be my segula. That means my oitzachov, my treasure, and my kingdom of priests, and my holy people. And I will never ever disown you. No matter what you do, I'm not going to throw you away. Hashem will never replace with another nation. This is what I'm offering. This is Hashem's estimation. But then there's the other column, right? But the Jews are offering. Hashem says, you want what I'm offering? Here's what I want from you. I'm going to give you a tater mitzvah. And you're going to keep it forever. All of it. Now there's a small problem. What's the small problem? God lives forever. We don't. So we have to commit Right? We have to commit to raise our children. That 3,000 and 300, and how many years since Matan are we? Uh, 
34 years, 3,334 years. Since last year was 3333. It was kind of cool, right? 3,300 data. We're going to still teach it to our kids. We're bound. And the Amish just says to the Jews, you're making the same deal I'm making. This, you can't get out of this. There's no divorce in this marriage. No, 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 not in this one. If you make a commitment, I'm not letting you out of the marriage. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to hold on to you, including do unpleasant things. This is the piece of paper that Hashem had in Moshe Rabbeinu proverbially. It said the Amish does offer. And at the base of that offer, I'll use the key word. It's a covenant. It's a bris. I promise I'll never change my mind. And the Amish is good in his word. And we have to return that with a covenant of our own. I promise I'll never change my mind forever and ever and ever. Me and my children, my grandchildren, I'll save Kala Deiris, are dedicated, are loyal, are mandated to continue this relationship. So Moshe took the contract to the Jews. He's the lawyer, right? He's the arbitrator, he's in between. He takes the contract to the Jewish people and he gathers them all together and he reads the contract. How do the Jews respond? One word, one word, one word, just one, not two, one. Nasa, we're in. We commit. Wait till the end of the class, yeah? So Moshe waits till the next morning. Now it's Wednesday morning. Gimel Sivan. He climbs back up. He tells the Abish that again, I don't know if he told him good morning. He just shows up. <laughs> they, they signed. But the Abish has to sign. We're in. So the Abish says, good. Let's make a meeting. <laughs> Let's make a meeting. So wait, so let's be clear about it. Today is a Yom Tif because nothing happened, right? Tomorrow is a Yom Tif. This is called Yom Amiyuchas. Jewish identity begins on Bay Sivan. That's tomorrow. Bay Sivan. This is the day we became chosen. And we committed to God forever. And He's not going to let us off the hook? Absolutely not. He won't. He's not going to let one Jew get lost. Right? When you say, uh, no Jew will be left behind, the Amish is going to see to it. Because that was the contract we signed with him thousands of years ago. Even the people who signed that contract are dead and buried for thousands of years. But to the Amish, it's all the same. We are there, we are them in different bodies. So that's why Bay Sivan is a Yomtif. Gimel Sivan is again a Yomtif. Because Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Amish that he didn't agree. And the Amish says, okay, let's make a meeting. What's such a meeting? The Amish didn't show up to the meeting. Huh? No. And the Yidin are going to show up to the meeting. And they're going to sit together at a table. They're going to have a lawyer. The lawyer is going to be Meshe Rabbeinu. Somehow Meshe Rabbeinu was a lawyer for both sides. When I and my wife was on Gizun, I bought a home. We had three lawyers. The buyer's lawyer, the seller's lawyer, and the bank's lawyer. And Allah <laughs> um, But they didn't need three lawyers. Meshe Rabbeinu was good for the buyer and for the seller and for the bank. There was no bank involved because there was no money involved. Taylor was given for free. In the desert, like it says in Gemara and in Rambam. And I shall make a meeting. So Moshe says to Abish, so what's going to happen at the meeting? Hashem says to Moshe, here's going to happen at the meeting. You and I are going to talk. You and I are going to talk. The Jews are going to stand and watch. They're not going to hear a word. They're not going to understand what we're saying. But they're going to see that I'm talking to you. And there's going to be two advantages of this. Number one, the fact that they see me talking to you is going to raise your honor in their eyes. They're going to need you because they're going to know that they have no direct communication with Abish. It's through you. You're the medium, right? You're the Navi. You're the prophet. And the second advantage is they really don't want to sit with me at the same table. They don't want to meet me face to face. It'll kill them. <laughs> right? Meeting the Abish at the same table is like walking into the sun. <coughs> so Hashem says, that's what's going to happen. We'll have a meeting. We'll invite the Jews. <laughs> They'll stand around, literally outside of a fence. I'll talk to you. They're not going to hear the conversation. But they'll see. They'll see. They'll know. They'll witness. They'll be Adis to the fact that I am talking to you. This very important thing, all the halachas of Nevuah are predicated on this Adis, that the Jews will witness that Hashem talked to Meshach Rabbein. They're going to be witnesses that I'm talking to you. It's going to raise your honor in their eyes and it's going to keep them alive. In other words, girls, 
But Hashem said to Moshe is, when I talk to a person that's called Navua, the Jewish people are not ready for Navua. They're not ready. They're not pure. They're not holy. They're not clean. They're not ready for Navua. If they'll experience Navua, the system is going to short circuit. So they're not going to become Navim. I'm going to talk only to you. The Abish was being very realistic. It was being very practical, very realistic. A, they're entitled to be at the meeting. B, it wouldn't be a good idea to participate in the meeting because they'd have to hear the Abish which we'd see the Abish which would be kind of difficult. So Hashem says to Meshach Rabbeinu, I'm going to talk to you. They're simply going to witness the conversation. And that's enough. This is what Hashem says, okay? Hashem says, this was when? On Wednesday, Gimel Sivim. This is called in Shulchan Aruch Mitzvah's Hagbalah, the mitzvah of the fence, of the fence. To separate Yidin from the place where the conversation is taking place. They're in the same room, but they're behind the Mechitza. They watch Hashem talk to Moshe, but they don't participate in the conversation. This was on Wednesday, Gimel Sivim. So Gimel Sivim is a Yom Tif that the Abish said, I'm going to talk to the Prophet, and only to the Prophet, but the Jews are going to witness that conversation. And this is a very, very big part of our Messiah, of our tradition, is the credibility of Nevoah, which is based on the credibility of Meshach Rabbeinu, which is based on the credibility of Eidos. We don't believe prophecy because of miracles. We believe prophecy because we're witnesses that Hashem spoke to Moshe. This is on Wednesday, Gimel Sid. Okay, Moshe comes out of the mountain. He gathered the Jewish people. He said, Hey, Sivan Abbasi, on Thursday, there'll be a meeting. The Abish is coming to the meeting, you're coming to the meeting, and I'm coming to the meeting. But here's the reality. You're not ready to speak to God. You're really not ready to speak to God. You're not. Uh, 50 days ago, 60 days ago, you were Shaku and Memtes Shari Tuma, you were immersed in all kinds of Tuma. You never speak to the Abish, do So you'll watch. And the Yidden said that Meshach Rabbeinu, the famous words, they say, they lives in If we can't talk to the Ebishter, there's no deal. If we cannot meet him face to face and talk, there's no deal. And Meshach says, you know, I think the Ebishter is pretty smart. It was his idea. It wasn't my idea. It was his idea that you shouldn't participate in the meeting. Because you're not ready for this. And the Yidin say, whatever it costs, if we cannot meet the Abishta face to face, we're not going through it. And what's weird about it is, Moshe knows that Hashem is right, but he's so proud of the Jewish people that they're, they're going on a suicide mission. They're going to die to meet God. He thinks that's kind of cool. So Moshe knows that this is a bad idea, but he's so excited about this bad idea, he runs up the following morning, which is now Thursday, Dalek even, and he records that Abishta. They don't like the terms. If they're signing contract with you, you and them are going to talk direct. I'll be there and I'll be the Mashgiach to meet you on the premises, but you have to talk to them. And the Abish says to Mesha, you're going to live to regret this. But fine. They want it, they can have it. And it's called Mitzvah's Prisha. That's what Dawad Sivit is called. If Gimel Sivit is called Mitzvah's Akbola, putting up fences, keeping Yidin away, Thou it means we should make yourself holy. You know how long it takes to become a Navi girls? Take a wild guess. How long does it take to become a Navi in this? A lifetime. The Jews got 48 hours. You imagine that? 48 hours. Oh, men, women, and children. Not just the Rashi Shivas and the Grace of Tzadikim. Every one of them. 48 hours, including the eight of Rav. 48 hours. Make yourself holy, become a Novi. In Chumash it says, I'll take you Elisha. But they had to do some serious soul searching. 48 hours to be a prophet. And of course we all know how that story ended. <laughs> okay, so now they're very busy. They're going to Mikveh and they're studying Zoyar and they're doing Iskafia and they're fasting and they're doing Tshuva and they're apologizing for all the Chesreinus and the Tukhaki and the Midas. they got 48 hours to be ready to become a Novi. It takes a lifetime and that 48 hours. Anyway, the next day is Friday, it's Hay Seven, mm-hmm. and the Yidna are busy with Sakamatani, so the Yidna are very busy with their Pishas, and Moshe interrupts them. And Moshe does something very, very, very important. Friday, Hay Seven, all the Jewish people became Gadim, they were converted. How do you convert? How do you become a Gadim? 
Number one, you have to have a bris milah if you're male. Number two, you have to go to the mikveh. Number three, you have to accept mitzvahs. And number four, you have to bring a carbon. The bris milah they did because they couldn't call b'neich aleichel. They can't eat carbon pesach if you have no bris. So the bris was out of the way. The bris milah was not a problem. Except for the few babies that were born in the couple of weeks between Lef and Simon now. Mesha brings a carbon. And he sprinkles the blood of the Jewish people. And the Gemara says that Asher brings it. You never sprinkle blood on a person in the base of Mikdash unless he went to the mikveh first. So the whole Jewish nation, the Yanganging, he tabled in the mikveh. And Meshach Rabbeinu reads what's called Sefer Habris. There's an argument of what Sefer Habris is. Some people say it's the contract. And now the Yidin say Nasa Venishma. Not Nasa, Nasa Venishma. So in the middle of the 48 hours of their being so holy and busy, doing tshuva and trying to make up for a lifetime of being shaku and avei desar to get ready to become a nobi emes, Meisha interrupts them and he is megayel them. He collectively converts them and their kabbalah sa mitzvahs, they're committed to do mitzvahs called Nasa Venish. Friday night? What do the Jews do? They were done already. They did 36 hours of this holy stuff and they were finished. Yeah, they were exhausted. Young Shlof. So the Rebbe says, Really? That's why they went to sleep? That's silly. If they knew, as I'm, as I'm dramatizing it for you, they had 48 hours to become the Viv, they wouldn't have slept that night. But they made a Cheshbin that it says in Chazal that when a person sleeps, the soul goes up to God and it draws life. And they thought they're better off asleep. Let the neshama go to Gan Eden. And in Gan Eden, they're going to learn the whole Tehran, they're going to experience all kinds of godliness. The neshama in Gan Eden will accomplish much more while they sleep than they can accomplish consciously. And by the way, there's an argument to be made that because it was before Matan Tehran, they were right. It's only we're after Matan Tehran, that's where we stay up and learn the Tehran, but they didn't have the Tehran yet. So they may have been correct in their assessment and their judgment that tonight, sleep, not sleep so you should rest, Sleep in the Shomish of God and you'll draw a lakus in a way that you cannot be prepared. And the Chosen showed up early to the Chupa. The Ebish the Chosen came on time. What's the idea? Bishes a misnagid. It came on time. What's the idea? Bishes a Chosid, huh? That he made one shir and didn't say a single Kiddish. Every one of us said is the Bishes of Yavad Aide was a misnagid. The Aide is a Chosid. What's the idea? He was a Fadi. He was doing a lot of singing. So everybody's happy or insulted or whatever you want. The Chassan shows up, Moshe Rabbeinu wakes the Yidin up and schleps them out of the camp. And the world is shaking. And the Yidin walk up to the situation, yeah, they watch Negevasa, and they said, May the Ani, and I shake it on, with all the good Zachan. They said, Shmai Yisrael, everything. They brush their teeth, I don't know if they ate breakfast or not. Very important, Moshe Rabbeinu Svan Davna. But I don't know if they had a chance that morning. And they say, you know, was this, was this a good idea? They're, they're thinking to themselves, was this a good idea? That we should talk to Hashem direct, rather than go through the lawyer. But it's too late, right? The in is in. And the Abisha starts to speak, which means they experience Navua, And their souls go flying out of their bodies. One times, two times, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, eight times, nine times, ten times. Now, I never had an experience of the Neshama leaving the goof and the Malachim go and they select them and bring them back and put them back into the goof using Tal Tchir. But after 10 times, the Jews said to Moshe, you know what? Let's go back to plan A. You be the prophet. You be the prophet. We'll go home and live a life. You'll tell us what God says and we'll believe you. So the Chumash says what? That Moshe was so disappointed. Moshe was so disappointed. Moshe, you know, is a pasuk in Chumash. Me eat and call on Moshe the Vim. I, I love for every Jew to be a prophet. Moshe wasn't afraid that he's going to lose his position of all Yidden on the Vim. He was, was, was delighted by the idea. He knew it was crazy, but he was excited at the same time. And then when the Yidden quit, because they only why why did they quit? Because they died. A, so so you die, but you know you're going to give up on the Vua because you're going to die. So Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Haiti was Hashem dibeinu. They're right. But the way it's understood, the words, I tell you, means double meaning. They were right to ask to be Nevi'im when they got to Aseret Sadibris. And they're right that the rest of the Torah, Teresh Baksav and Teresh Baper, they should get through you. Both were right. The decision 
of Ritzeneinu and Linus of Malkeinu was the correct one. And the decision to say it's enough. Shuvu lachem lachem, go live normal lives. And the Va'ata Peya made him money. Meshe Rabbeinu was going to stand by Yochum with Nebuchadnezzar and Yidin to bring to us Dvar They were right to want to speak to me directly to the Senes of Dibris. And they're right that the rest of the ten they're going to get from you. And that's why each day is a Yom Tif. It's a different Yom Tif, right? It's the day of nothing. <laughs> it's the day of Yichis. It's the day of fences. It's the day of holiness. It's the day of Geiros. And they're Matan Tevis. Six days, six Yom Tevis. Okay, Kabbalah, Satera, Vesimcha, Bapimis.